Turn to Revelation 9. Frankly, what we have to talk about this morning is not real pleasant. Uh, This isn't um, one of those, you know, passages of Scripture that you look at and you see the events unfolding here that are futuristic. We believe in a futuristic viewpoint as we approach the book of Revelation. Um. But what we see in this chapter is hell unleashed. That's, that's never a good thing. That's not a pleasant thing. And yet there is a sense in which it is because God is in control here. He's even in control of hell. And he's going to use hell for his purposes. I don't think that that means that God is necessarily having to dictate what hell is doing. But that he is allowing hell to do what hell does. And allowing, just taking his hand off, allowing the forces of hell to do what they do. And yet he's in control of that and allowing that judgment to take place. So, while well, you and I will admit that we've seen or at least heard of some pretty amazing things that have happened, maybe even what we would call miracles, we're not accustomed to seeing the kind of miracles that we, by faith, as believers, are convinced have happened in the past. How many of you here this morning believe that God created the heavens and the earth? Okay, (laughs) we believe that, right? That's incredible. That's a a miraculous event. It's just, it's amazing to think about. It's incredible. And yet there's no other plausible explanation whatsoever for all the, and we see plenty of evidence of God's creation. We believe that Christ was born of a virgin. That is a miracle. We've never seen that in our lives, have we? But we know what happened. We know that Jesus, God's Son, was born of the Virgin Mary. We know that He lived a sinless life. He became our substitute as He offered Himself on the cross in payment for our sins. And He rose again the third day. There's another miracle. We've never seen anything like that. But Jesus raised from the dead. Now we might have life. So just as we, in faith, Believe in these events that took place in the past. Even though we haven't witnessed any miracles on that level in our lives, we also in faith as believers are convinced that there are some miraculous things that are going to take place after the church age as well. Things that we've never seen in our lifetimes. But there's some pretty incredible things that are going to happen. We've already seen some pretty unbelievable things in our study of Revelation, but going to rise to another level here this morning as we approach chapter 9. The fact of the matter is, though, God wants you to escape the wrath to come. His mercy and His grace are always extended, even in the face of judgment. We've seen that over and over again. We'll see that again today. It's... um, a little bit more challenging to make application for us today through from Roman or excuse me from Revelation chapter nine, but we're going to do so at the end, and I think legitimately so. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin looking at these verses. Father, again, we want to thank you for who you are, that you're always good. When you pour out your judgment, you're good. It's because you're good that you have to pour out your judgment. You are righteous and holy. But Lord, you, because of Jesus, offer mankind redemption. We don't have to experience the wrath of God. Because Jesus, if we'll accept him by faith, has taken our wrath for us. What what an incredible thought. What a blessing that is. Pray if there are any here this morning who have never put their faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation, this will be the day. But Lord, as believers, which I am convinced that the vast majority of us here are, we also want to respond to these realities in a way that you would have us to. We want to be, we want to be joyful Christians, enthusiastic Christians, always celebrating the goodness of God and the blessings we have in Him. But we also want to be sober-minded Christians, to recognize the holy hand of God and that there is coming a day where you will have to judge the earth. You are long-suffering. You are patient. You are extending your mercy and grace even this very day. You are long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day is still coming. 
there comes a day when you will say enough is enough and you have to pour out judgment. But Lord, I just pray that these realities would spur us on to be the believers you want us to be and for those who have not trusted Christ to trust him. So we ask your spirits, superintendents, as we look into this chapter here this morning. And again, just uh, pray for those unable to be with us and those that are sick or just away for other reasons this morning that you will just demonstrate your goodness to them. And Lord, we do just, again, lift up your people, Israel. We pray, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we just pray that even these events would sober Americans and others across the globe and people will be turned to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so in verses 1 to 12 here, we have the fifth trumpet sound. Remember, there are seven. We've looked at four. We are now looking at the fifth. Let me read verses 1 through 12 here of Revelation 9. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running in battle. They had tails like scorpions, and... There were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name of Polyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So the fifth angel sounds the fifth trumpet. And it all unfolds for us here in these, verse, these 12 verses. First of all, we see a star again. We've seen a star before in our study. In chapter 6 and verse 13, we read of one. It says, And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by the mighty wind. We also see a star in chapter 8, verse 8. There it says, the, Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. So per, meteors, things of that nature, fall, uh, uh, have fallen. This is a little different. Here we have an, uh, what is not an actual star, but an angelic being. You'll notice the masculine pronouns attached to this star. In verse 1, It says that the star had fallen from heaven to the earth. And it says, to him was given. And in chapter 2 it says, and he opened the bottomless pit. So we're talking about an angel here. Some believe this angel to be Satan himself. Others say that this is a very powerful underling of Satan's. I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. <laughs> um... Whoever he is, he is given the key to the bottomless pit. Literally, the pit of the abyss. It is, it is apparently the, the prison where some of the demonic hordes are incarcerated, a place of severest torment and isolation. So we have this star that is personified here in verse 1. In verse 2, we have smoke from the pit. So, so this angel, this, this fallen angel, perhaps Satan himself, opened the bottomless pit, and smoke like that of a great furnace rose out of the pit. 
The smoke was so thick that the sun and, frankly, the entire atmosphere is darkened by it. We've seen similar things like that as well in our study of Revelation. This time it's smoke. Then in verses 3 through 10, we find scorpion-like power. Out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth. Now, these are not normal locusts. Um, they are especially prepared ones that are actually the outward manifestation of demons. Note the description here in verses 7 to 9. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. Some description here that gives some, some personality to these, okay? These were demonic forces. They were commanded not to do what normal locusts do. They weren't to destroy the grass or anything green. Instead, they were to torment men, mankind, for five months. They were given power like scorpions of the earth have power. And for a very special purpose. The scorpions mentioned here, the word that is used here is, would speak of, a, of an arachnid that inhabit warm, dry regions. They have erect tails tipped with venomous stingers. John MacArthur says, and I quote, A scorpion victim often rolls on the ground in agony, foams at the mouth, and grinds his teeth in pain. The demon in locust form... The demons in locust form are able to inflict the physical and perhaps spiritual pain like the scorpion. End quote. So their purpose is to inflict pain on those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Verse 4 informed us of that. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, anything green or any tree, only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Verse 5 says they were not to kill them, but to torment them five months. Normal lifespan of a locust, I'm told, is five months. Again, these are not normal locusts, but that's just an interesting observation. You see there in verse 10, they had tails like a scorpion's. They were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. What an incredible what an incredible event. Devastating. Notice verse 11. It says here that there was a, a king, a leader, a prince, we might say. They had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. So these locusts had a king over them. The angel of the bottomless pit. Once again, some people believe that this was Satan. Some suggest that this is still that same fallen star that had the key to the bottomless pit. Others believe it's, it's two different beings here. Perhaps Satan was the first one and an underling is another one. It, it, I don't know for sure on that. I, just, I call it a satanic prince because it's certainly from the satanic realm. Abaddon is his name in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek. Both words, of course, mean the same thing. They mean destroyer. Destroyer. So that's the fifth trumpet. Not a pleasant event. Obviously something of a supernatural nature here. This is, this is like the paranormal, okay? Um, this is not what we would call normal. And... Uh, Again, we'll, we're going to just go ahead and move on to the sixth trumpet now, and then we'll, we'll pull in some application after that. But let's look at, at the remainder of the chapter, then verses 13 to 21. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, 
saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of, of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So here's the sixth trumpet. If the fifth wasn't devastating enough, this one certainly will be. And of course, we know they both are. First of all, we see killer angels. Verses 13 to 15, the altar of incense. You might remember in your previous studies about this altar that had four small horns, one at each corner. This is a piece of the furniture there in the temple and the, the tabernacle and then the temple where incense was burned signifying the the prayers of God's people so this is normally a place associated with God's mercy and and his the answer of to prayers and once again I think it's an answer to prayers here it evidently represents the prayers of the martyred tribulation saints who cried out to God for, for him to exact vengeance upon those who had persecuted them. The four angels that are called upon to be released here are not holy angels. Make no mistake about that. Never in Scripture are holy angels described as being bound. These again are fallen angels. We're not told the significance of the Euphrates River in this passage, but I find it interesting. Interesting, The Euphrates is one of four tributaries that flow from Eden. And we know that Eden is the place where Satan first accomplished his dirty work on mankind, tempting Adam and Eve, resulted in the fall and a curse on the entire universe. Though these are fallen angels, it's clear that they have been bound and set aside for God's purposes at this time. Look at verse 15. The angels, these four angels, who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year. That's pretty specific. These were bound. They were being, they were set aside. There was a, there was a, a time in God's framework in which they were to be released. And then look at the uh, colossal. There's a killer angel. Sorry, I'm not using my clicker very well here. There's a colossal army here introduced to us in verse 16. All of a sudden, it's kind of out of the blue. All of a sudden, I think it's just implied that these four angels were released and they are apparently leading this 200 million man army. I say man army. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But it's a colossal army. This is a lot of people, a lot of soldiers, a lot of beings, okay? Some, there's again a lot of speculation about this army and these four angels. Um, some, some speculate that this is the same army that we'll see in chapter 16 of Revelation, um, the same army that, 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 that is brought together by kings of the east who will cross the dried up Euphrates River as they march toward Israel and, they, and, and that final tribulation era battle, the battle of Armageddon. 
But that army and battle is associated with the seventh trumpet, not the sixth. So I tend to not take that view. Others see this as another demonic army, even larger in number than the demonic locusts that were released from the bottomless pit during the fifth trumpet uh, judgment. I'm going to throw something else out to you here. I think it is possible. And again, I'm, I'm just throwing this out as conjecture and helping us to maybe to see some things here. It's easy for us to, to look at these events. And because, as I said in the introduction, we haven't seen anything like this to think, well, that can't be. This is just sort of far-fetched. We, we try to explain it away as, as strictly symbolic. And while there is clearly some symbolism here, and, and certainly John is trying to, to describe something to us here that he's never seen before. And he's got to use terms and, 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 des, and, and describe this in some way that we'll have some kind of visual understanding of what he's seeing. So what I'm about to say, I don't want you to think, don't take this as gospel truth here like, like this is the way it's going to happen. But this is speculation and it's a possibility. It's possible that this is some kind of a hybrid human, de human demonic army. I want you to listen to the words of Todd Hampson. And I'm going to give you a few different quotes from him in his book on Revelation. And he says this, and I quote, It is widely known that the militaries of several countries around the world, notably China, have been experimenting with DNA splicing to create super soldiers and other chimera-like creatures. For example, scientists have already begun to breed super dogs that have twice the muscle of normal dogs. And they have been editing human genes since at least 2015. End quote. Some of you I know have heard about these dogs because we've, we've had conversations about them before. Now, Hansen continues here, and I quote, There is also a vast and growing secular movement known as transhumanism. People who believe in self-guided evolution using emerging genetic and cybernetic technologies. The leaders of this movement are trying to achieve eternal life apart from God through integrating technology with the human species. It is the merging of man and machine, end quote. Now remember, John is attempting, as I said a moment ago, to describe something that he's never seen before. Look at those verses again, 17 to 19. I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. This is their armor. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of a lion, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. But you see that, you see that description there. Um, their powers in their mouth, verse 19. Their tails, their tails are like serpents, having heads. This doesn't sound like your normal army at all, does it? So let me quote Todd Hansen one more time. He says, Going back to the 200 million man army, John describes the members of this army as riding horse-like creatures with lion-like heads that launch fire, weaponized snake-like tails, and bright colorful army of red, blue, and yellow. For all we know, the horses described, he puts that in quotes, horses described by John, could be some type of demonic weaponized chimera or John's attempt to describe the weaponry that will be used in the future. He goes on, Add to our current knowledge of super soldier programs and the transhumanism movement the fact that during the tribulation period, evil will be fully embraced. Revelation informs us that evil rulers and their unbelieving subjects will openly practice sorcery, witchcraft, and demonic worship. They will partner with demonic entities to devise plans like the world has never seen. It is widely known that Hitler and the Nazis were steeped in occult practices. Now imagine a time much worse than that, led by a ruler much more wicked and powerful than Hitler, a ruler who has technology far superior to anything that has ever existed. Whatever the nature of this 200 million man army, it will be unlike anything the world has ever seen before. 
I don't know if you've ever done it before. If you've ever taken the time, I've done it a little bit. Look up, look up some of these things and read about them and it'll, it'll shake you. <laughs> it's incredible what's going on. What mankind has been able to achieve. Now, I, I'm not trying to scare anybody here this morning, really. Now, I guess if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you should be concerned. <laughs> Those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, we're talking about an event that's going to happen after we're out of here. Okay, and I praise the Lord for that. Just do a little bit of, of research on, on the technology that's going into robots nowadays. And you can watch robots that, can, that have the, a, a very similar agility and ability that the human body has. You couple that with some of the things they're doing, as he said, in this transhumanism movement and DNA and human human DNA editing and so forth, as well as artificial intelligence. And this is way more plausible than we would have thought 20 years ago, <laughs> that this is some kind of a hybrid army. Now, this is, I'm, not, I'm not saying here that, that, that I'm, not, I'm not saying anything to you today that means, oh, well, this means Christ could have never returned 100 years ago. <laughs> yeah, he, he could have if you, if you'd have chose to. It, these things don't have to happen in order for the Lord to return. But as you see all this happening and as you see uh, what's described here, it kind of comes into focus a little bit more as we see the advances in technology and the advances, if you want to call it advances, in the evil of mankind and how they will use technology in evil, evil ways. And what will this army do? They will kill one-third of the earth's population. Now, many people will have already died during the tribulation, particularly at the fourth seal judgment when war, famine, and disease will have killed one-fourth of the world's population. If we just use today's numbers, and the numbers may be vastly different when the time, that time comes for this to actually happen. It could happen any time, but let's just use today's numbers. There's approximately 8 billion people living on the earth. If the tribulation were to start now, two billion would die during the fourth seal judgment, leaving six billion people left on the earth. The sixth trumpet judgment will result in the death of one-third of the six billion, leaving four billion. That means that half and over half of the world's population under that scenario will have died at the conclusion of the sixth trumpet judgment. The world will have never seen anything like this before. There's been some devastating things happen in the world, and they continue to. And it just it troubles our hearts when we see what goes on even currently with the attack on Israel. We see earthquakes that are just taking lives, all kinds of devastating things. And yet none of that will compare to what is going to be unleashed when hell is unleashed in this sixth, fifth and sixth trumpet judgments during the tribulation. But you know what is absolutely remarkable? A couple of things that are really, really remarkable here as we look at verses 20 and 21. So you have half the world's population <laughs> dead. Now there were those that were protected by God. They were sealed, His servants. But verse 20 says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues Think about this. They did not repent of the works of their hands. Talk about hard hearts. It just demonstrates the depravity of man and how hard a human heart can be. And even after all of this, they will not repent of their works. They will not repent of their, their worship of demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood. They won't repent of their murders, their murders, their, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, their thefts. There's a couple things here. One thing that we see is that apparently, not just apparently, I mean, it's, it's, it's evident here that repentance is still available. <laughs> would, he be, would he be bringing this up if repentance weren't possible? No, he's bringing it up to demonstrate how hard-hearted people will grow here. But repentance is possible. 
The reason they won't repent isn't because they cannot repent. It's because they will not repent. These are calloused souls. I'm sorry. I already got changed for me there. Calloused souls in verses 20 to 21. Hardened. So how should we respond to these future realities? Well, certainly, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need to trust Him. There is such danger in putting that off. Because throughout Scripture, we find it demonstrated that, it is, that, it, that the more you reject Jesus, the more you refuse to, to, to repent, to turn from your sin and to turn to Jesus for, for salvation, not just from the consequences of sin, but from sin itself, the harder your heart can grow. And I think that's demonstrated because we've seen it over and over in our study here how mercy and grace have been extended and extended and extended. They are now. And they're going to still be extended even during the tribulation time. There's going to be 144,000 witnesses and many, many people are going to be saved in the tribulation. And yet the vast majority are just going to get harder and harder and harder and harder. So never put off the opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and trust Him for your salvation. If you're trusting Christ as your Savior, listen, doesn't, this should sober our minds, should sober our hearts, and realize there's a whole lot more to live here, live for than this world. This world is under the leadership of Satan himself, and he so wants to lure us in as believers into the things of this world to make us ineffective for Christ. We need to be a people that are, are different, that are holy. We're called upon by God himself to be holy because he is holy, and he wants us to be a light in this dark world. He wants us to, to be instrumental in rescuing people from this kind of judgment that's coming. And of course, what comes beyond the tribulation is the lake of fire itself which is for all eternity. And at that point, there is no more room for repentance at all. So, sin is clearly the problem that will bring the world to this ultimate destruction. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans chapter 6. Father, thank you so much. For Jesus, Lord, it's easy for us to take our salvation for granted. It's easy for us to lose sight of where we would be and where our eternal end would be without Christ. Help us to contemplate that, to ponder it, to, to, so that we might just again be renewed in our appreciation for the salvation we have in Christ. And that we might have a, a growing burden for those around us that don't know you. Lord, right now, mercy and grace are extended. You are patient. You're long-suffering. You are waiting. Your desire is that people come to repentance. Lord, just use us how you can and, and how you'd like to. Help us to be the yielded, Christ-like servants you want us to be, to make disciples and to make disciplers. That we might see the multiplication of your people your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.